yeah, I've been at a, a little bit of a loss lately about what to do my next episode on, so this isn't an episode. It's not that I haven't been reading. Uh, I never stop reading. I think I keep up my uh, usual pace, which is, um, I can say without ego, probably pretty impressive to most people. I, I read a lot. And, and I'm reading a lot of good stuff, and um, I just need I just need to think about some of the stuff I'm do reading a little more. Maybe go back and revisit some of the older stuff, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, as you know, after my Dark Age episodes, which seems to have gotten a really good response, which is great, um, uh, maybe I'll be sticking with stuff from that era for a little while. Maybe, we'll see. Obviously, uh, we're going into October, and um, this, ep this doesn't have anything to do with that, but... Um, since I was just sort of reminded of something and thought I could throw something up. Although, you know, I never want to just throw something up here to, you know, fill a gap or space. I want it always to be entertaining and interesting and insightful. But this is uh, more or less for kind of one person, although I'm sure other people can benefit. This is from my buddy Orc, who um, I said that I would do a video response to uh, a short video he'd done on his favorite slasher films a while. And since I always, uh, slashers have always been my favorite um, subgenre in the horror genre. I said that was something I'd really like to try. Just just a simple top five, nothing too big or elaborate, because if I did like a top ten, it would probably take too long, just because that's my style. So um, it's also kind of funny. I don't actually own most of the movies that I'm going to bring up. But uh, anyway, um, just sort of jump into, yeah, my um, top five slasher movies of all time. Um, number five, we're going to go with uh, 1981's uh, My Bloody Valentine. That's a... Uh, movie that was shot in uh, my native Cape Breton in a small community called Sydney Mines and it's about a, and it could it could even be set there which I think is something that's kind of neat about it and something I get a kick out of is it's supposed to be this small mining community that's obviously um, uh, on the coast because they show shots of the ocean and stuff and um, some of the some of the characters dress up and you can get the feeling that you know the people in the town are either miners or they're fishermen and I, I, I like that about it of course but but more than more, yeah. There's more to it than that, obviously, because I mean, it's, here it is in my top five. Uh, I just think it has a lot of merit, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things brought to the genre at the time. Um, nothing groundbreaking or amazing, but the fact is, here it is, 1981, and sort of the fad at the time coming from Friday the 13th, and which spun off from Halloween, is you know taking sort of like holidays and themes like that, and and wrapping the slashes into that. So one about Valentine's Day was inevitable, but I think what they did, the, the story about the whole minor thing, um, was sort of a fresh take and an interesting idea, um, because miners, of course, you, you've got that, uh, that gas mask, so it has a mask built in, and um, carrying a pickaxe as his normal weapon, um, you know, it's something that just seems sort of like a no-brainer that somebody would eventually ra gotten around to. So I just really enjoy that movie. Of course, it was, um, at the time, infamously had some of its content cut out because it was considered too violent and only in 2009 did they finally release um, a version that I could have bought a few weeks ago and I didn't but I think I'll probably be buying it before Halloween now that uh, restores that footage. Originally it was said to be about eight or nine minutes apparently it's only about three and a half minutes. Um, uh, another little interesting fact about it is that um, Quentin Tarantino has gone on record saying it's his favorite horror movie or at least his favorite slasher. Um, I haven't seen any sort of nods to it in any of the movies he's made, but then again, he hasn't really made any straight-up horror movies outside of his work and stuff like Dust Till Dawn, which, to be fair, isn't really his movie. So um, maybe someday he'll do more of a straightforward horror type thing, and we'll see some nods to that, which I think is cool. And anyway, we're already taking up a lot of time. Number four um, is probably the original A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is not exactly a conventional slasher, but I still think fits the mold. It's, um, it's not because there's a supernatural killer, because you can have supernatural killers, and it's just simply that Freddy, his, um, his modus operandi, uh, the way he works, is a little different from the average slasher, of course, you know, the, the main idea is simply that he kills you in your dreams, which causes you to die in real life, which I just think was a, r a really brilliant idea, a really neat idea that Wes Craven came up with, that's 1984, Spawned a very successful uh, series. Um, not all the sequels are bad. Uh, I think the third one is one of the best horror sequels out there. Freddy is a very iconic villain. Of course, we've seen the remake in, within this past year, which I don't think is quite as bad as a lot of people want to say. I'm not going to get into that. It doesn't have anything to do with this list. Of course, Robert Englund is, is Freddy. He's very memorable. He's very menacing. In later movies, he's sort of watered down and cracking jokes. But in the original, he's definitely very menacing, very scary, very sinister. Um, 
the movie's also helped by having good actors in it, which you don't see in a lot of that. And I don't just mean, like, oh, Johnny Depp, because you know, we all know what he went on to become. Um, the main girl, whose name I can't remember the moment, Nancy, is a very one of my favorite Survivor Girls. Survivor Girls are very important in the slasher genre. Um, very few slashers uh, don't have one. Every once in a while they'll go off the board and have a Survivor guy or have a guy and girl. But Survivor Girl is a very important trope, and it means a lot to me. Almost uh, always I can sort of judge some of these movies by how, how much I like the Survivor Girl in it. That's actually sort of one of the reasons why I tolerate the remake. I really enjoy the new girl's portrayal as Nancy. Uh, a lot of people have complained about it, and that, that's them, and that's fine. Anyway, moving on. What else we got? Um, number three. Hmm. How would I put this? I guess it's probably going to be Black Christmas, 1974 classic. A lot of people could argue it is the original slasher film. Um, it's a Canadian movie, directed by Bob Clark. He's not Canadian, but he, um, he did a lot of work in Canada with Canadians. And um, I'm not just trying to like uh, point out how great it is because it's a Canadian film, just because I am. But um, there are some things that you do need to keep in mind about it. This is 1974, and if it was being made in the States and backed by American producers, um, Bob Clark and other people have said it might not have seen the light of day. Oh, hi, Wednesday. That's my cat Wednesday. She's never actually been in a movie with me before, but she's always here. Hey. Okay, then. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry about that. Oh, don't don't get in front of the camera, Wens. Uh, making me lose my train of thought, you stupid cat. Uh -huh. No, and it was because um, so certain elements in the movie, not just because it was violent, but also because the survivor girl in this, um, just, or at least our main character, she's pregnant out of wedlock, and not only that, but she's planning to abort her baby, which nowadays we don't really think much of um, but at the time, and because it's also easy to forget how conservative the United States was then, and still is, really. One thing I often forget, because when I deal or think about Americans, it's always people within the artistic community, or just friends that I've met online and things like that, um, that even today, America is a very conservative country in a lot of ways about things like that, violence, abortion, a, a million things, and um, again, I don't want to go off track here and uh, lose my train of thought, but... Um, yeah, so Black Christmas had a lot of great, great elements that we'd see later on. It even beat Halloween to the punch with the whole point of view thing. A very interesting, very scary killer. Um, this was the movie that originated the whole the phone call is coming from inside the house thing. Uh, a lot of people uh, mistakenly attribute that to other movies, but it's actually this movie. Um, beautifully shot, I think. It, and a really great just, juxtaposition of, um, of terror but with um, the happiness of the holidays, it's about a sorority house and about the girls who are just about to leave for Christmas holidays. And we've got like great things of like children caroling outside, and then we have these very scary, violent deaths. Um, I, I think it's just brilliantly done. Once again, like most of these horror franchises, a remake has been made that I think is just absolutely terrible. They try to expand more on the villain's origins, which, just like in the Halloween remakes, is just a bad idea. It takes the mystique off and makes it stupid. And I think that inevitably, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, what remake is ever going to surpass an original? It, it'd be a very rare thing indeed. Um, so, moving on from that, uh, my number two might surprise a lot of you, but it's it actually is Scream. I always have a soft spot for Scream, 1996, another Wes Craven offering. This time it's basically him uh, openly spoofing the genre that has made him a household name, which I think is very clever. Again, how clever, I don't know. Somebody else would have gotten to it, but you have to remember that the slasher genre was, had died out in the mid-90s, and this really sort of brought it back. Um, it was sort of the last gasp for most of the franchises going on there. And they become really tired and predictable. And even though you could say they become tired and predictable even by the end of the 80s, which is fair, there's still more demand for it by them. By the mid-90s, I don't think there was quite as much demand. Um, uh, but Scream really breathed new life into things. Uh, again, you just had a really interesting cast of characters. And not just the characters, the cast has always fascinated me. It just seems like a bunch of really unlikely actors to put together. No A-list stars, just sort of a lot of B and C-list type people we were aware of from other things, TV shows and, and things like that. And I, I always thought putting them together was really interesting, just a very interesting blend. Um, I'll always love the movie. Uh, it's funny, I'm on my 90s kick, just because of how how inexorably it's always going to be tied to the 90s for me. Just so many things about it. Uh, you know, I was about 12 when it came out and saw it probably... I, I think I saw it even before I was 13, but m maybe not. But anyway, in that era, you know, where I'm... 
I'm just in junior high, and I'm really looking up to high school kids, thinking, oh, that's where I want to be, and, and, um, and of course, it centers around high school kids. Uh, again, very fresh and original. How fresh and original would, wouldn't somebody else have eventually come up and done the same thing? Probably, but isn't it great that Wes Craven is the one who did it? Uh, uh, like any horror franchise, sequels are weaker. Again, I'm easier on them than most people, and I'm not saying I sh that, that I should be. It's just because of the soft spot I have for the characters and the storyline. Um, of course, Scream 4 is supposed to come out sometime next year. I don't know how I feel about that, but I will definitely watch it. Okay, and brings us to number one, which I'm sure you could probably guess is simply Halloween. Um, Halloween 2 almost made this list. Um, here's Halloween 2. The problem for me with Halloween and Halloween 2 is that I very rarely watch one with a, watch the first one without just going into the next one. I don't separate them much. As far as I'm concerned, even though they were made three years apart, and Halloween 2 was basically made by pressure on Carpenter from the studio to make a sequel. He didn't want to make a sequel. He figured it was open and shut. But it's the, only, it's the last one with his direct involvement. And I pretty much just sort of view them as the same movie. Halloween 2 picks up right where Halloween 1 ends. Halloween 1 doesn't even end with the end of the night, and just continues and has sort of a satisfying conclusion with um, both Loomis and uh, Myers blowing up. And I always thought that was great. But again, I can't count this, so we'll, we'll just go with the original here, Halloween. Um, there's not much I can say about it without repeating things that people have already said, but of course... Uh, Black Christmas came out before it, but I think it really took the idea of the mask killer and made that popular. Maybe you're surprised if Friday the 13th didn't make this list. Would have made a top 10. I know that's the most prolific slasher series out there, and arguably the most um, influential. But I, you could also argue this is just, just as every bit as much influential, because pretty much anything that worked in uh, Friday the 13th was something that our 13th was something that had already been proven and tested in Halloween. Um, Halloween, of course has a very surprisingly, by today's standards, low body count, low gore count. Um, less is more in a lot of ways. It's a cliche to say, but it really is. Um, Michael is very nuanced, his, the performance. Um, just uh, very sinister in sort of a vague, hazy, unknown, mysterious way, which is what I like. Again, I think the main failing, and uh, I could do a whole bunch of videos on just how much I hate Rob Zombie's take on the series, um, is that I like that Michael is just supposed to be this embodiment of evil, and we're not supposed to really know much about what's going on inside his head or his origins. His origins are very normal, and I don't like when Rob Zombie takes it, takes it and twists it. In this, he just comes from a normal affluent family, no abuse, no weird things, and just sort of out of nowhere commits this horrible act of evil, and from then on is just set on it. Um, you've got uh, Donald Pleasance with a really great performance as Dr. Loomis, who, uh, in repeated watchings, you do he does seem sort of repetitive in the way that he's just trying to warn everybody and nobody's listening to him, damn it, about how he understands, he's the only one that really gets how dangerous Michael is, how there's no way to rehabilitate him, uh, that he's something beyond human, and he's very evil, and um, as the movies uh, and sequels go, that he's basically unstoppable. Um, another thing that sets it apart is, while it's a sort of, again, a fairly low-budget movie at the time, uh, very good acting by mostly unknown actors. Not amazing acting, but when you take it and compare it to many slashers that would follow in the 80s where the acting is just laughably bad, it's very good, very well shot. Um, I'm a huge Sean Carpenter fan. This is the main reason, but he's proven after that that he's very good. So, uh, yeah, that's my list. Again, mainly for work, but I'm sure other people can probably benefit. At least I hope so. We'll talk in comments next time. We'll do a real episode. Um, moving into October... We'll try to talk about some stuff that, you know, has a Halloween-ish edge to it, um, because, well, I don't know, that's fun. I like, I like dark stuff, I like scary stuff, um, a uh, bit of stuff I've been reading has been leaning into that, so, um, hopefully I'll come up with something like that soon, and, um, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. I'll see you guys later. Alright, peace, true believers.